Pickup in ALS 2011, as before. Uh, if you haven't gotten it, they will be there uh, available for your pickup uh, at your convenience. Um, what you see on the screen is a grade distribution uh, uh, about where you stand uh, after adding your first two scores together. Um, students always ask, I don't put minuses and pluses on there. Well, I think you can sort of figure that minuses are going to be down here, pluses are going to be over here. So I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, as always, if you have concerns or questions about your grade, please feel free to come and see me. I'll be happy to meet with you. And um, that's about it. Um, the average on the exam, as I noted in my email, was 75. That was a significant jump over last time. I was pleased to see that. Uh, there was a lot of material. So you guys did, shh, you guys did a good job of um, getting on top of that very large body of material. Uh, I was very happy to see that. People always ask me, you know, do I make exams harder or easier, et cetera, et cetera. And the honest to God answer is I don't know. Um, I would have guessed that would have been a harder exam and people made a 75 on it. So it shows you how much I know about my own exams, I guess. I don't know too much about them. In any event, I'm very happy to see the improvement in performance and um, I hope that you will continue to do that. We are moving into the final stretch now. And in the final stretch, we're moving towards the final. The final this uh, term will be like the final last term. You will be able to use a note card, and the note card you have to get from me. Uh, I'll make those available, not quite yet, but I will make them available closer to the final, and I'll announce or else bring them to class uh, so that you can uh, have a note card to work with. Um, that will hopefully help you to stay on top of all the things that you need to stay on top of. Um, we're getting ready to move now into transcription. And so transcription, uh, of course, the synthesis of RNA. And um, transcription is sort of broken up into, into pieces, partly because your book breaks it up into pieces. So the first parts of transcription that I'll be talking about today and tomorrow relate to um, very basics of transcription and have little to do with what uh, the, the later things we'll talk about in transcription, which are gene expression. And so uh, gene expression really relates more to how it is that cells control the relative amounts of individual proteins that they have. And part of that control is a transcriptional control. But I won't be talking about that control in the lectures today and on, um, on Wednesday. So that'll come later in the term, is what I'm saying. So two lectures here on transcription, and then two lectures on translation. And then we'll move into other things. So hopefully you won't get overwhelmed in that process. One last thing I'll say relative to the final exam is that this term will be like last term, the coverage of the new material on the final exam will be roughly proportional to the coverage that you've seen uh, in terms of the total lectures. So we've got about nine lectures left um, for the final exam. And that's roughly a third or so of the, the total lectures in the course. Yes, ma'am? The final exam will be in this room. Yes. Is that good or bad? As long as you know. OK, yeah, it's important to know that. You have that, I had that happen one time. You, you know, you're a student and you go to the wrong room, right? Boy, that's terrible. I still had night. You guys have nightmares about going to the wrong room. I think that's a universal thing. You dream that you're you're doing that. I I still dream I'm a student and I've done something like that. It's kind of a scary thought. Nightmares. Okay. Well, um, let's think about transcription. So, first of all, transcription is not translation. All right. Uh, I'll say that, and I will still see um, probably 5% of the class that will still have difficulty with confusing those two terms. All right? Just because they both have trans at the beginning doesn't mean that they are the same thing. They're very different things. Transcription, of course, is the synthesis of RNA using DNA as a template. Translation is the making of protein using RNA as a template. Okay? So they're very different things. Transcription um, uses uh, polymerases. DNA replication used polymerases. The polymerases we use in transcription are known as RNA polymerases. And they have some similarities to DNA polymerases, and they have some significant differences to DNA polymerases. One of the similarities you see on the screen, um, that looks like kind of a mesh of stuff, but if you kind of use your imagination, you can see that this looks not unlike a hand, and this looks not unlike a hand. The DNA actually fits in this little region right here. And so 
That was kind of what we saw when we had this, the schematic representation of a DNA polymerase. We saw that sort of hand notion. So structurally, there are some at least vague similarities to DNA polymerases. In terms of action, RNA polymerases are like DNA polymerases in that they move only 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Only 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Now, there are some differences. One of the differences uh, is that RNA polymerase does not, underline not, require a primer. That's why DNA replication uses an RNA polymerase to make its primer. So RNA polymerases do not require a primer. Another big difference we'll see in transcription is that transcription does not occur anywhere near as fast as DNA replication does does not occur anywhere near as fast as DNA replication does. DNA replication in E. coli we saw went at the rate of about 1,000 nucleotides a second, a pretty remarkable rate. Okay? Transcription is pretty lucky to go about 50 nucleotides a second, 50 nucleotides a second. Oops. All right, we're acting up here. take care of the problem. So transcription goes at a significantly slower pace than DNA replication does, and partly because it doesn't have to go so fast. Okay? DNA replication, there's a race to get the genome copied so that the cells can divide. RNA polymerases are copying only segments of the genome. They're not trying to copy the whole genome. They're trying to cover the regions that correspond to genes genes being a section that codes for protein or some functional part of the genome. And those typically are in the order of a few thousand bases, not a few million bases. So RNA polymerase doesn't have to work as fast as DNA polymerase does. RNA polymerases don't have proofreading. There is some slight editing that's done of RNA transcripts. I'll say a little bit about that later, but it's not done by RNA polymerase. Okay, so that means that transcription is relatively error prone compared to DNA replication. Now that always causes people a little bit of concern, and the reality is, is that you shouldn't have hardly any concern about it whatsoever. On average, your average RNA polymerase probably makes about maybe one mistake per transcript or slightly less than that. Okay? You say, oh, error is bad. Okay? Well, error is not so bad here because RNA transcripts are not there permanently. So use them for a while and then they break them down. RNA is much less stable than DNA. Cells make and break down RNA routinely. So if there's a non-functional RNA there that has a, a critical mutation in a coding sequence for a protein, it's only one of probably many copies of that RNA, and it's not going to be there forever. So those two combine to reduce the need to have a very high fidelity of uh, transcription by the RNA polymerase. Okay. Well, RNA polymerases, and by the way, I'm talking, what I'll be talking about, at least in the first part today, is all about prokaryotic RNA polymerase. In prokaryotes, there's only one RNA polymerase. It's known as RNA polymerase. Okay? In eukaryotes, there are three primary ones, and I'll say more about them later. Okay? They have specialized functions. In prokaryotes, all of the RNAs are made by the same RNA polymerase. Now, when we talk about the RNAs, of course, we, know, we recognize three major types of RNA. The messenger RNAs that contain the message, that is the uh, information to be translated. The transfer RNAs that carry the amino acids to the ribosome. 
and the ribosomal RNAs that are the components that are structural and catalytic components in the ribosome. So those three things are uh, all made by the same RNA polymerase in E. coli and in other prokaryotes as well. Okay, well, so talking about prokaryotic RNA polymerases, we see that they have several subunits. They're known um, as an alpha 2, beta, beta prime, and then a sigma factor. That is the one that I'll probably say the most about with respect to uh, the individual RNA polymerases. Two copies of alpha, one copy of beta, one copy of beta prime, and one copy of sigma. Now, cells have different copies. That is, they have different sigmas. And as I will describe later, those different sigmas allow the cell to respond to its environment under different conditions. So some sigmas are made under regular conditions. Other sigmas are made, for example, when the cell gets heat shocked. Okay? The sigma, as we shall see, is involved in helping the RNA polymerase to recognize the promoter. It's involved in helping the RNA polymerase to recognize the promoter. So if you change the sigma factor, you can change the sequence it recognizes as a promoter. And that, we will see, will become a very important consideration later. Okay? All right. Now, I'll say a word in a bit about the beta subunit. Other than that, I won't say anything about the other uh, subunits um, that we'll be concerned about. The active site. The active site of an RNA polymerase uh, is depicted here. And though I didn't show you the similar thing for the DNA polymerase, at a rough approximation, they look similar. Both RNA polymerases and DNA polymerases use cations, usually magnesium, in their catalytic mechanism. They use magnesium ions most commonly in their catalytic mechanism. What an RNA polymerase is doing is very much like what a DNA polymerase was doing. It's reading one strand and then making a um, set of phosphodiester bonds with adjacent nucleotides that are complement have bases that are complementary to the ones that they're reading. So where it sees a C, it puts in a G. Where it sees an A, it puts in a U. Remember, we have RNA where we have U instead of T. Okay. And it makes phosphodiester bonds. It starts with triphosphates, just like DNA polymerase. One big difference, of course, is that RNA polymerase, not surprisingly, are using ribonucleoside triphosphates, NTPs, ATP, GTP, CTP, and UTP. This shows the um, RNA polymerase uh, basically how it lays relative to the DNA that it's, be, that it's copying. And we have a convention that we use to describe the nucleotide in DNA where the very first RNA base is put in. Okay? We number the DNA according to that. So the DNA nucleotide that corresponds to where the very first RNA base is put in is labeled as zero. Okay? Well, actually, it's labeled as plus one, so zero would be the one before it. But suffice it to say, that's, that, that's where our plus one is. So the numbering is there. When we see anything that's ahead of that, we see those as negative numbers. So this is an RNA polymerase that is going to bind to this DNA looking like this. It's going to put the first nucleotide in here at plus one, and it's going to move to the right. Now, what you see, therefore, is that the RNA polymerase is capable of binding to sequences ahead of that plus one site. The RNA polymerase is binding to sequences ahead of that plus one site. And you'll see those sequences stretch, in this case, about 40 nucleotides or so ahead of the plus one site. The plus one site, again, being where the first RNA nucleotide is put in. The sigma factor we see is playing a role in the recognition of sequences there. And I'll say more about that uh, in just a little bit. OK, so when we look at RNA being made in cells, what we discover 
is that the RNA isn't randomly made throughout the genome. There are specific places where it starts and specific places where it stops. That's not surprising because genes have specific places where their coding starts and specific places where their coding stops. So the RNA that's made by a cell spans those regions. It generally starts ahead of where the gene starts, and it continues on through past where the gene ends. So the RNA that's made okay, includes a, a bunch of stuff at the front end, which is the 5' prime end, that never make it into protein, and a bunch of stuff at the 3' prime end that also never make it into protein, the protein coding sequences being in the middle of that. Now, prokaryotes don't usually put a lot of nucleotides at the 5' prime or the 3' prime end. But they do have some. Okay? And those some we'll see are very important when we get to talking about translation. So there's a few nucleotides at the front, a few nucleotides at the end that are not part of the coding for the gene. Okay? All right. So if I were to look at a messenger RNA that, that had been made by an RNA polymerase, nucleotide number one would correspond to that plus one region that I showed you on there. But it would not be coding. Coding might not happen for another 20 or so. So at about 20, about plus 20, we would start to see coding, and then translation could occur from that point. I want to be very clear about that, OK? So the coding region does not go all the way to the 5 prime end. The coding is internal to it. We'll talk, as I said, in prokaryotes, it can be about 20, 30 nucleotides inwards. OK. Now, so we're in, one of the things we're interested in then is, well, where, in fact, does transcription start? And where, on a piece of DNA, does a protein bind to? Because the, we're going to see that proteins binding to DNA help to control what's being transcribed. In the case of RNA, in the case of prokaryotes, RNA polymerase actually binds to the DNA directly. In the case of eukaryotes, we'll see that RNA polymerase does not bind first, at least. Other proteins come in first. So we need to have a way of understanding where on a piece of DNA that proteins are binding. So I'm going to describe, first of all, a technique to you. It's a technique called footprinting. And footprinting is a pretty cool technique. OK? Now, let's imagine I've got a segment of DNA. Let's say it's a few hundred nucleotides long. And I think that somewhere in there, there is a sequence that my RNA polymerase binds to before it starts anything. OK? So I would like to know exactly where in that sequence that my RNA polymerase binds. Everybody with me? OK. So to do this, I set, excuse me, I set up an experiment with some radioactivity. I take a DNA molecule, and at the end of the DNA molecule, I put a radioactive phosphorus. And that's very easy to do in the laboratory. And radioactive phosphorus makes it very easy for me to follow the DNA molecule. So that's that little red blob on the end. That's a radioactive phosphorus. OK? Now, I take and I've got my radioactive material, and I divide it into two segments. One over here on, on, on the left, one on the right, as you see here. OK? The one on the right, I put in my RNA polymerase, or whatever protein I think it is that binds onto that DNA. So I put in my DNA binding protein over here. For the tubes on the left, I, the tube on the left, I don't put anything. Okay? So one tube has the DNA plus the protein that I think binds. That's the one on the right. One tube has only labeled DNA in it. Everybody with me so far? OK. Next, I take and I add an enzyme to each tube in very, very, very tiny quantities. This enzyme is called DNase. And DNase is a very powerful laboratory tool because what it will do is in very, very low concentrations, it will nick DNA once. OK? It will nick DNA once. So if I nick my DNA, all right, so let's just say I, I have a nick right here, I'll get a segment that's that long. 
Everybody with me? Okay. Now, in a tube, I've got millions of labeled DNAs. And I've got a DNA that on average is going to nick each one once randomly. That is, the location of where the nick is is going to be random. What will happen after that nicking is I will get a segment, of, a series of fragments, and notice by the way we, we've denatured, we've removed the other strands to get this here. Okay? That's not important for our purposes, but we had to do that to get here. We nick it, okay? And if we have a lot of DNA molecules and the nicking is random, I will get a complete distribution of all possible sizes. This one might be 499 nucleotides long, 498, 497, 496, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I get a whole distribution of every possible size of nucleotide, all of which has the same nicked end. Now you might say, well, what happened to the other end? The other end's not labeled, so we don't see it. Okay? So we don't care about the other end, we don't care about the other strand, we only care about this end. Everybody with me? Now, if I were to take this and run it on a gel, I would see something that would be interesting, but actually relatively boring. I would see, well, here was 490, 491, 492, 493 nucleotides long, 494, 495, etc. I would see what we call a ladder. Each one differing in size by one nucleotide. This ladder could be several feet high. It might have a thousand steps in it. Okay? So I can actually see a pretty wide range of sizes with this guy right here. Well, that doesn't tell me anything. What tells me something is if I do the same experiment with this tube. When I do the same experiment with this tube, nicking is also random, except wherever my DNA binding protein is, it covers up the DNA and prevents nicking from occurring there. So now what am I going to see? Well, I'm going to see things that get nicked here, here, here. Nothing that gets nicked where the protein is covering the DNA. And then I see additional nicks here, here, and here. But what that means is I will see these guys, the big guys. I will see these little guys. And I will see a segment where there's no nicking. That segment where there was no nicking is where my protein was. And I can look and say, oh, well, look, it was 490, 491, 492. It was 493 nucleotides away from the end where this protein was bound. And it went all the way up to, say, 496. I know how far that protein covered that DNA. So footprinting, DNA is called DNA footprinting, is a very, very powerful technique that allows me to map precisely where a protein binds on a DNA. Questions about that? Yes, Laurie. Well, certainly you can do some uh, process of elimination, but if you have no other knowledge, then you want to get as big of a DNA molecule as you can. Yep. Everybody understands that? Okay, good. All right, so that's what's involved in DNA footprinting. Now, footprinting turns out to be useful not for what we're going to see here, but for telling us where on proteins that, uh, where on DNAs that proteins bind. We'll say more about those later. But I want to say some other things now relative that are actually slightly related to what I just talked about. And this relates to some interesting sequences that we see in DNA. Okay? So we're going to turn our attention now away from technique and actually look at DNA sequence. All right? Well, Using some sophisticated techniques, I can determine where nucleotide number one is. That's the first RNA nucleotide that's made in a given messenger RNA. I'm talking about messenger RNA right now. Okay. If I take and I have a bunch of different regions of the genome, remember that the cell has thousands of genes. So they're going to have thousands of different places where RNA is going to be made. Okay? Thousands of different RNAs. And I've just taken every one of those RNAs and I've lined up their first nucleotide right here. 
Okay? And it's going to move to the right. All right? It's going to move to the right. Now, when I look at that, I see, interestingly, the first one frequently is an A. It's not always, but it's frequently an A. When I look for other things in there that are of interest, I see another region that's called the minus 10 region. It's also called the Tata box. Minus 10 Tata box, OK? Now, the Tata box is shown in green. And you look at it, and you say, well, they're not all the same sequence. You're right. They're not all the same sequence. But they are similar to each other. Here's a T-A-T-G-T-T. -T. Here's a T-A-T-G-G-T. T-T-T-C-A-T. All these guys are rich in AT. And if we line up dozens of these and say, well, what's the most common nucleotide at each position? What we find out is that we have what's called a consensus sequence that has this sequence right here, T-A-T-A-A-T. This is where the term ta-ta box comes from, because ta-ta, right? Now, remembering that AT base pairs have two hydrogen bonds, and GC base pairs have three hydrogen bonds, it's interesting that this guy is going to only have relatively weak hydrogen bonds. And that means it's going to be easier for the strands to be peeled apart. And that turns out to be very useful and very important. OK? All right. Now, this guy is not the same as this guy. Right? We all agree there's no T-A-T-A-A-T -A 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 on there. OK? They vary in how similar they are to this. One of the things we need to start thinking about is actually gene expression that we'll be talking about later. When we think about gene expression, we think about, well, as I said, how much of a given protein a cell is making. You've already seen some different examples of this. Think back when I talked about DNA polymerase 3. I said, for example, that Kornberg didn't discover it originally because there's only about five or six copies of it in the entire cell. It was in very low abundance. The one that he found was DNA polymerase 1, for which there were thousands of copies. Remember that? Well, how is it that we have only five or six copies of one gene and thousands of another? Well, there's a set of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is how much RNA the cell is making. OK? So cells that are copying the gene for DNA polymerase 1 are making a lot more messenger RNA for DNA polymerase 1 than they are for DNA polymerase 3. Right? That makes, sort of makes sense. The more RNA they have for, for, for a given gene, the more protein they're going to translate from it. So now we begin to see why the relative amounts of RNAs is important. And part of the way that that varies is by how related to this sequence a given, a, a given region is. Okay? This region is called the promoter. So the promoter is a control region. I'll tell you my shoe here. It's a control region. It's located in DNA. Part of the promoter is what you see here. I'll show you there's more to a promoter than this. But part of a promoter is what you see right here. So it's a control region. It's a control region in the case of prokaryotes that's recognized by the RNA polymerase. And it binds to it. The closer to this sequence that a given gene's minus 10 region is, the more RNA is made from it. If I had something that was T-A-T-A-A-T, -A 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 -T, I would have an awful lot of RNA made from it. If I had something like, oh, let's say this guy right here, not quite so similar, I wouldn't have as much RNA made from it. OK? Everybody with me? OK. So 
That's the minus 10 region. There are other regions that are known to be involved in help and being part of a promoter. And again, we're still talking about prokaryotes. Eukaryotic promoters are much more complicated. In prokaryotes, there's another sequence that is very frequently found called the minus 35 sequence. And you can see the sequence up there. It doesn't have a cute name other than the minus 35 sequence. Okay? But these two together appear to be important in allowing a gene to be tra tra transcribed. So they're important regions recognized by RNA polymerase that allow a gene to be transcribed. The similarity of this guy to the TATAAT will help control how much of that RNA is being made. Now, why do you suppose that the similarity to this sequence has anything at all to do with how much of a gene is made? Well, a lot of yawns today. Celebration over the weekend after the... What's that? Is there a certain number of tatas that it recognizes? Is there a certain number of that it recognizes? It turns out in um, uh, eukaryotic cells, there are multiple sequences that are recognized, but no. It turns out not to be the case in prokaryotes for the most part. Any thoughts? Lori? It's more easily recognizable. More recognizable. What does that mean? color. <laughs> <laughs> it's its favorite color, of course. That's the answer. <laughs> Well, you're right. It is. It, it, it has to do with how well the RNA polymerase has affinity, how much affinity it has for that sequence. Keep in mind that RNA polymerase is making hydrogen bonds with the DNA, and those are going to be sequence dependent. So the more things that there are closer to this, the easier the hydrogen bonds can happen with the RNA polymerase so it can bind more strongly and then take off and do its thing. If the sequence differs from this much, there's even less hydrogen bonding and less to hold the RNA polymerase in place. Okay, very cool, very interesting um, uh, observation. And these have been known in prokaryotic cells uh, for a long time. Notice that the promoter never ends up in the RNA. The promoter does not end up in the RNA. It's only in the DNA. Okay. Now, it turns out that there are other promoters that are recognized, some of which have virtually nothing to do with a Tata box. Now, based on what I've told you, you would predict that these guys really wouldn't have any transcription going on at all. But under certain conditions, they can, you can have a lot of transcription coming off of them. So now we need to understand how it is that cells switch what promoter they want to transcribe. Okay? Or what, what promoter they want to bind to to transcribe the gene. All right? This turns out to be a function of the sigma factor. So the sigma factor helps to, de to establish what sequence the RNA polymerase is recognizing. Most of the time, when everything is going hunky-dory for the E. coli cell, it's got a sigma factor that it makes that recognizes Tata boxes. Nothing unusual going on here. Just go about our business and make our protein. Okay, Make our RNA so we can make our protein. Okay. Now, something happens. Okay, Life happens even to an E. coli cell. And one of the things that can happen in an E. coli cell is that it can get shocked by heat. Let's say the person in whose gut this E. coli cell is residing develops a fever. Okay? Your temperature might rise from 37 degrees to 39 degrees centigrade. Okay? You recall from last term that changes in temperature can affect the folding of a protein. We can unfold proteins with heat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So some of our most susceptible proteins might, in fact, unfold if we change the temperature. And I think I talked last term about one of the things that are made when a cell gets shocked by heat is something called heat shock proteins. 
They're made primarily when a cell has suffered that heat shock. And one of the things that they make is something called a chaperone. What do the chaperones do? They help the protein to fold properly. Okay. Well, if I'm in E. coli cell and everything is going hunky-dory and I'm at 37 degrees, I don't have to worry about misfolding and so forth. I might not need a lot of chaperones. But when I hit 39 degrees and my proteins start unfolding, it would sure be nice to be able to be making a lot more chaperones. And it turns out that when E. coli gets heat shocked, they make a different sigma factor. The sigma factor that it makes during heat shock have nothing to do with recognizing Tata boxes. They start recognizing other sequences. Look at this guy. This doesn't look at all like a Tata box, which means that normally there's not going to be hardly any messenger RNA made from it. But under conditions of heat shock, a sigma factor comes in and it loves this guy. It causes transcription from this thing to go like crazy. So the cell starts making a lot of heat shock proteins and responding to that environmental change. Very, very important thing. Okay. There's other ones, nitrogen starvation. There's others involved in just general starvation. Yes? So are you that yeah, very good question. So her question is, am I saying that temperature itself is a transcriptional regulator of the, the, the sigma factor gene? And it turns out it is. Okay? So temperature is controlling whether or not the sigma factor gene is being transcribed. Yes? Okay, so her question had to do with the, 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 the closeness of the top to box. And when I'm talking about closeness, I'm talking about the closeness in sequence, not closeness in distance. So all Tata boxes are about 10 nucleotides away. So if I change that by much, it really will change where the RNA polymerase starts. So the RNA polymerase, when it recognizes a Tata box, it's going to start about 10 away. Okay? When I, so, the, so the distance I was talking about was not distance, but change in sequence. So instead of having T-A-T-A-A-T, -A -A if I had a T-A-G-A-A-T, it would, it, would be, it, would, it would not be as closely related in sequence. That, that's what I meant by distance. The minus 10 and minus 35 sequences will position where that plus 1 is going to be. That's right. OK? OK. So sigma factors, therefore, play a very important role in helping the E. coli cell to respond to its environment. That's a very cool thing. It's a very simple system. We'll see that eukaryotes have a much more complicated system or set of systems. There's not one system, but a set of systems that they use. But we get to be, begin to get the, the, the glimmers of what eukaryotes do. Eukaryotes, in fact, use many proteins for many, many, many different situations. Okay? Prokaryotes have a relatively simple set of proteins that they use to do their thing. Okay, uh, let's see. So let's actually look at transcription going on. When we look at transcription, we uh, sort of schematically draw this uh, looking like here. There is a region of DNA that is unwound in order for the RNA polymerase to start copying it. Now this is a little different than what we saw in the case of DNA polymerase. We thought of this fork coming together, and we just thought of those ends just coming off of there. Not, in other words, not being attached to anything else. They were, but that's not the way that we draw them. Okay? With RNA polymerase, we have to keep in mind that this DNA is going this way, this DNA is going this way, and the RNA polymerase is going this way. What happens as the RNA polymerase moves is we see what's called a transcription bubble. A transcription bubble is just this unwound region that allows the RNA polymerase to have a segment to start copying and start making RNA. So if you remember, the DNA polymerase had to have a single strand that it copied. 
so too does the RNA polymerase have to have a, sing, a, a, a single strand for it to copy. Okay. Chain growth, pretty straightforward. We have uh, a, a, an incoming triphosphate. It is linked to an existing one, just like we saw in DNA, making a phosphodiester bond, like we see here. And then that goes on, making another phosphodiester bond. So here's the very first one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. So we have monophosphates in between. One difference that we see with RNA is that the very first one still has three phosphates on it. So the far five prime end of a messenger RNA is still a triphosphate. That's not going to change. That doesn't happen with DNA. It only happens with RNA because remember DNA doesn't have its own primer. RNA makes its own primer. Okay. Let's look at that transcription bubble a little more closely. Okay. Now, what we see in the copying of this is this guy in this diagram is moving left to right. It's moving five prime to three prime in what it's making, which means the strand that it's reading must be going three prime to five prime because they're anti-parallel. Okay. The, you say, well, there's two strands. How does it know which one to do? It knows which one to do by the fact that the Tata box and the minus 35 sequence have positioned it properly so that only the other strand is the one capable of being copied. Okay? So only one strand is capable of being copied once it's bound to that minus 10, minus 35 sequence. Carl? Are there Tata boxes on both sides? Are there Tata boxes on both sides? No, there's only one, and that's important for orienting. So you have a Tata box, so you have a minus 35, you have a Tata box, that now tells the RNA polymerase, when you bind here, you're going to go this way. Okay? We have two possible strands. The two possible strands have names of DNA. Okay? The strand being copied is called the template strand. A template is what we're copying. It's the template strand that's running 3 prime to 5 prime, and the RNA polymerase is copying it 5 prime to 3 prime. The other strand of DNA is known as the coding strand. That's a little bit of a misleading name because it's not used to make protein. But if we think about it, it has the same sequence as the RNA does because of complementarity, except for it has a T instead of U. So the coding strand is the non-copied strand. The template strand is the one that's copied. But the coding strand has the same sequence as the RNA, except it has a T instead. It has T's instead of U's. Another thing to note here is that this guy, this RNA, after it's made, starts peeling off. You see this little tail? It doesn't stay base paired with the DNA. Instead, it comes down and falls off like you see here. Now, that'll become important for terminating transcription, which I'll say just a little bit about. Okay. Two last considerations. To peel strands apart, okay, I have to unwind in advance, just like I had to unwind in advance of the DNA polymerase. Remember I had a helicase? Okay. I don't have a helicase doing this, but I have, at least I don't have the same helicase doing this, but I still have to unwind the strands. On the back side, remember I peeled the strands apart. Now they're going to start coming back together. I have to have something on the back side to wind the strands. So unwinding in the front, winding in the back. What are we going to need to do all this? Topoisomerases. And now you start to see why topoisomerases are useful for both winding and for unwinding. Winding is important at this end. Dealing with unwinding is important up at this end. Okay? Okay. So that's the, the sort of gist of what's happening during the phenomenon of transcription. And nothing there. Let's see. 
Okay, now, uh, let's, uh, so, so everything I've shown you so far has to do with starting transcription. We'll say more about initiation later, right? So the Tata box itself would be actually on the coding strand. Yes, ma'am. How okay, the question is, how would it know to peel off? Um, that's actually a, a good question. A part of it is, is that, that that end can flop a little bit, and when you start winding the DNA strands together, there's no place for the RNA, and it gets squeezed off, kind of like if you had a... Uh, a hot dog, and you squeezed it so that you know the, the the goodies came out. Same sort of thing. You're sque literally, it's being squeezed out by the winding at the other end that's going on. Okay, dumb analogy. Best one I can come up with off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't use it. Yeah. All right. So everything I've related to so far is how uh, that process gets started. And after, when we think of transcription, we can think of it occurring in three uh, general phases. Initiation, which is what we've been talking about. Elongation, which is relatively boring. And finally, termination, which turns out to be kind of interesting. Kind of interesting. And I'm going to say something about one of the termination mechanisms here, because I think uh, you'll find this kind of cool. All right? Here is a picture of an RNA sequence. This RNA has already been made. The RNA polymerase it made, it started here. It's moving this direction. It made all of this stuff. And look at this. Okay, This is near the end of a gene that's being transcribed in E. coli. And this gene has a bunch of base pairs that make a very cool structure that we call a stem loop. This sequence will start pairing all by itself because the base pairing rules say, oh, look, I can pair, 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 pair. And RNA does a lot of pairing with itself. DNA doesn't get the chance to do it because it's usually in a duplex. But RNA is usually single-stranded, so it gets a chance to pair with itself. Now, imagine I'm an RNA polymerase. I'm going along. I'm copying the DNA. I get to this little stretch of U's right here. And all of a sudden, this thing goes sprawling, and it forms. OK? The DNA is down here. This thing has just sprung. And my butt has just got, if I'm an RNA polymerase, has just gotten lifted up. It's just lifted the butt end of the RNA polymerase off of the DNA. And now the RNA polymerase is not nearly so tightly attached to that DNA. It's even less tightly attached because looky here. UA base pairs don't have much in the way of hydrogen bonds. This sprawling just caused the RNA polymerase to fall off. Okay. It just caused the RNA polymerase to fall off. This is a sequence-dependent termination mechanism. It's sequence-dependent because if I didn't have this stem, the possibility of making this stem loop, I wouldn't have something kicking off the RNA polymerase. Everybody got that? So it's kind of a cool mechanism, OK? It literally forms this and kicks the RNA polymerase off. Then everything falls apart. The DNA goes back to being DNA, and everybody's happy. OK, next time I'll tell you about an even cooler mechanism for terminating transcription. Are the um, GC rich? They are. They are. They are. Okay. Which helps, helps them to form. That's right. You bet. Hi, uh, this is uh, Kevin and uh, Gil from one time. I just changed the batteries from the wireless microphone. I put the last set of batteries in. Uh, if you can replace them, this, this microphone uses double A's. 
Okay, thank you. No, no, I, I just finished class, but I want to let you know so that you have some more in your room. Thank you. Hi. Uh, in both strands, in the uh, Tokyo region, have a high affinity for binding because of both age.